you need to relax. You need to take a step back. So when I say relax, that's relax for you. That's not relax for what your husband would do or what your homeschool other mom friend would do. What do you need to do to relax? And always relax is going to mean that you put the schedule away, that you cross stuff off that to-do list and you don't get them done. You just put it away. It's, it's for you to kick back and breathe. And you might not leave your house. You might go to the coffee shop. You might go shopping. It's whatever you need to do to relax. And you need to give up control because you really um, cannot control everything. Hi, you're listening to the Zan Tyler Podcast. When my family started our homeschooling journey, there were so many decisions to make. But one of our best decisions was choosing to use BJU Press Homeschool. I've never seen my kids so excited to get textbooks before. I'm amazed by how interesting and interactive the lessons are. My kids actually look forward to them. We use the online video lessons for all our courses, but I know some families choose to teach from the textbooks. What I love is that I can trust BJU Press to uphold our values. The Bible and biblical principles are woven throughout each subject. I'll admit, I was a bit nervous when I started homeschooling, but I've found a wonderful online community of other BJU Press homeschool families and consultants. The Homeschool Hub also makes my job easier. I can set up our schedules and rearrange them with just a few clicks. On the dashboard, I can see each of my kids' progress, and the assignments page shows me quickly what's ready for me to check or grade. I'm glad my son's biology assignments are automatically graded. BJU Press Homeschool has given us the tools and confidence to homeschool our children. For more information, do what I did and visit the BJU Press Homeschool website or talk with your local HomeWorks consultant. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Zan Tyler podcast, where our goal is to help you thrive on your homeschooling journey. Let me take just a minute to ask you to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. And if this podcast has been encouraging to you, please leave us a review on Apple Podcast. Each review really helps us. We're also available on YouTube now, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well. You are going to love my dear friend, Barb West, our guest for today. Barb is a mom to five and grandmother to six little ones, and she homeschooled for 34 years. She and her husband, Bruce, a retired Air Force pilot, have lived all over the world with their children. She considers their military nomadic lifestyle to be a missionary journey the Lord financed. Barb and Bruce also have a compelling adoption story that will inspire you. Barb is a speaker and a board member for the Global Home Education Exchange. She and Bruce established home organizations wherever they lived. The latest is the Colorado Springs Homeschool Sports League. Barb's chief goal is to inspire homeschooling moms in their journeys. Stay tuned. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, Barb, thank you so much for being here with me today. I have been so excited about this podcast because I know how much you have to share with homeschooling moms. Well, thank you, Zan. And I just want to hang out with you. That's what I want to do today. I've been looking forward to just chatting and sitting out on the deck and talking to you. Well, it has it has been a while. Um, Barb runs a group in Colorado Springs, and I flew out last February and did a women's retreat there um, in, in Barb's Fountain House. So it was it was a lot of fun and great fellowship, and I've missed you ever since doing that. Okay. So Zan, you were like a real speaker when you came. I mean, you are a real speaker. (laughs) So the rest of the time we've had normal, what I would say, homeschool moms come and talk, but you put us at a new level when you came and it was so good. Your devotions were spot on. They were exactly what we needed to hear. Your book was perfect. Uh, It was just a really great time. I loved having you and I would host you again in a heartbeat. (laughs) You want to well, come, you and Joe, come on out. Okay. We're putting our name in the hat. We want to come back. Okay. You know, it's really a special time. You've done a lot of that of work in that group and so have others. And just the attitude and the spirit is in the group is so special. So it makes it, it easy is. for me as a speaker to come in. But I really appreciate that. So Barb, tell us about your family and how you got interested in homeschooling. Well, I'm married to Bruce. And we've been married for over four decades. And we have five children. They range in age from 40 down to 20. 
And the bottom three, as we talked about them, are adopted. And we had wanted to adopt from the very beginning, and it just never quite worked out. But when we were in Oklahoma, I was about to have my second child, and I thought, well, I'm so into the baby, I'll send my oldest to preschool. So I did that. I sent her to preschool, and she thrived. She loved it. And then it was coming up time for kindergarten, and I couldn't afford private Christian kindergarten. And so I thought, well, she's not going to public school. What do I do? And a friend said, hey, I read an article in a newspaper about this woman that teaches her kids at home. And I thought, wow, I've never heard of that. I'm not sure I could do that. But I looked her up in Oklahoma and she wasn't too far away, a couple, maybe 45 minutes. And I drove out to see her and she had a big box for each of her three children. They were full of textbooks. And I recognized those textbooks from 15 years before when I was in school. And I hated them then. And I thought, there's no way there is. I don't want to go through them a second time. So I thought, I can't do this homeschooling thing. So as I'm driving back into town, crying, beating on the steering wheel, telling God, I can't do this. He said, go to the Enid Christian Bookstore. Now, this is a little town and they had an old town square with the with this the Christian bookstore there. So I go in and there were three books on homeschooling. And I thought, okay. So I thought, well, there really is something out there called homeschooling. So I bought one of the books. It was Mary Pride's Big Book of Homeschooling. Uh And at that time, there was one volume. I think later it went to four. There are four. That's right. That's right. And I started reading and writing and marking it up. And so I said to Bruce, hey, I'm thinking about homeschooling. And his reaction was, you are not going to lock our firstborn in a closet. And I said, did I say I was going to lock her in a closet? Because that's not what homeschooling is. So I educated him. And then I thought, well, I'll tell her preschool teachers what we're going to do. And I told them, and they were really supportive. They said, every year they open it up that parents and grandparents can come. You make your reservation at the school and you go and visit. So we did that. Bruce and I went. My mom was in town. My father had already passed away. So each semester, the three of us would go at separate times. They said in that whole year, we were the only family that visited. And they said, you will be perfect for homeschooling because you take such an active role. And I started reading more and looking. So we started in Oklahoma uh, homeschooling, and then we moved to Texas and then South Dakota. And South Dakota is where I feel like I really got planted in homeschooling. So, so that's our beginning of our journey. So tell us what Bruce does. Well, right now he's retired, but he used (laughs) to be a B-1 pilot in the U.S. Air Force. And then he flew for a company called Avenge, and he went to Afghanistan for about a year and a half to two years. And then he was a pilot for United Airlines. And he just retired last fall. Okay. So now pick up your homeschooling story in South Dakota and tell us about the 22 households you set up throughout the world while you were in the process of homeschooling? Yeah, well, we, with Bruce's job in the military, we moved frequently. And at the beginning, we were homeschooling. We got, we went from Oklahoma to Texas and then South Dakota. And that's where I actually met other homeschoolers. Prior to that, I didn't really know anybody that was homeschooling. But I got there and I think there were about 20 families And I thought, wow, this is huge. There's other people that are doing this. And I met them and I started helping with what we called children's enrichment. So we would have an activity every month for the kids, maybe an art fair, or they might have speech and drama at Christmas. We would do recitals because everybody had some Christmas piece they were working on. And that's how I got really involved and met the other families. And the group really grew. Uh, We started going to the HSLDA, National Leadership Conferences, Homeschool Legal Defense Association would put on this conference every year. And we went and we learned a lot. And that's where I met you, Zan. That's right. That's right. And it was, I think that was actually here in Colorado, but we didn't live here. It was at Glen Airy in Colorado. And we just really got encouraged and found other like-minded people, leaders. And we thought, okay, we can encourage our families And that's really been the basis of everything that I do. Can I encourage another homeschool family, another mom? Can I get these kids, you know, in an activity that they really enjoy? Uh, In South Dakota, at a little area called Terry Peak Ski Area, they would do a homeschool ski day. All you had to do was show up um, and they would give you a free lesson and free equipment. Uh, And so we would buy lunch there and they would make, their money on everybody, all these big homeschool families buying lunch and they teach them to ski. <laughs> right. And we did that 
every year. And the first year we had a hundred kids. The second year we had 250. And after that, they said, okay, we're going to have to put you in groups. You can't come on the same day. You gotta come on oh, that's days. amazing. Yes. But it was, that's, that's what I like to do. Get families out, out of the house and socializing with other people. I think a lot of times moms are looking at their kids socializing. They're always like, oh, what about socialization for the kids? But you know, mom needs that connection too. She needs that heart connection. And that's really where my heart is now getting moms connected because if moms are getting fed and they're getting encouraged and their, their love cup is being filled up with those relationships, they're going to be better homeschool moms at home and wives that, to their husbands. That's right. And I think virtual relationships are important in homeschooling. And I know people do some classes over the internet, but I will tell you when you're a homeschooling mom, there is nothing like face to face, heart to heart, yeah fellowship and being with other families and other women who are going what you're going through what you're going through and being able to see them and touch them you know and just enjoy their presence oh i have to i have yeah. to tell you this about barb they she and bruce are big skiers i mean they're ski instructors <laughs> they're rescue skiers and their dogs are named after famous ski slopes around the world where they've skied so <laughs> Yeah, so, I just find that so fascinating because I can't <laughs> ski. I mean, I I've skied twice. You, I'm not sure you would call it skiing, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sam, I'm not sure ski. what you call it. <laughs> but yes, if you slapped some boards on and went on the snow and went down any kind of what you felt like was a hill or a slope, you skied. We, um, so my son is a great skier. I mean, he's done black diamonds all over the continent. So finally I learned how to ski one year. This has nothing to do with homeschooling except for John was trying to teach me how to do something. Now he's trying to teach me how to ski. I got so frustrated going down the mountain. It was a green or a blue. I'd been on the baby slope, you know, I finally, I said, stop John. And I put, I stood and put my arms around his waist. I was facing him and I had my skis over his skis. And I said, your job is to make sure I get down this mountain. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's, he skied. I think we were, I think this may have been a, a homeschool ski trip too. So he skied me down the mountain. So I have, I have great respect for your skiing. So tell us a little bit about where you went from there. So we lived in South Dakota. Then we went to Alabama and each state has different laws. And so Alabama was different than where we'd been. We went from Alabama to Virginia, Virginia, we went to Germany. Then from Germany, we came back to the States. We went to Idaho. And then from Idaho, we went to Germany again, a different place in Germany. We lived in the Alps. And then we went from Germany back to Washington, DC. Then we went to the Philippines. Then we went directly to Romania. Then we went back to Washington, DC, and then we ended up here in Colorado. Well, that so is sometimes amazing. we were places for years. Other times we were only places for three to six months. And you continue to homeschool your kids wherever you lived. Yes. And I took advantage of places we lived. When we were in Virginia, I thought, wow, we could live on the beach. So we rented a really small little uh, apartment on the beach. So it was one bedroom, two bath. And I set up a bedroom in the living room for the girls and we had this kitchen, but we were right there. We could see the dolphins every day going up and down um, and in the Chesapeake Bay. It was great. So each place we lived, I tried to do something exciting that was there. So I tried to change my mindset for where we live. So even though we're mountain people, we were on the beach. I'm like, okay, let's live on the beach. Let's figure this out. This humidity, <laughs> this water, the sand, the salt, let's figure this out. So it was, it was a learning experience and an adventure each place, but I tried to make it fun and enjoyable for where we live so that we weren't trying to recreate living in um, a mountain home or living in the desert. We tried to live where we were and enjoy where we were. And, you know, that's so important because it really does emphasize the point that when you homeschool, the world is the classroom. And most of us will never have the experiences you had in terms of world travel and world living, but we can really take advantage of the things around us. And, you know, what our region is known for, whether it's the beach or the mountains and, and make sure that our kids are exposed to life in the real world. I mean, I, I really do believe that the world is the classroom for homeschool kids. And that's what makes homeschooling so effective. 
Tell us what you think the greatest benefit of homeschooling is and why you and Bruce kept homeschooling through all of your journeys and all of your travel. Yeah, I think the greatest benefit with homeschooling is freedom. Now, for some people, when you have freedom, there's nobody telling you what to do. And in some instances, that can be a little scary because you don't have somebody saying, okay, check this box, do this, do that at this time or this month or this year or when your child's this age. So the freedom to just explore and do what you want to do at the time you want to do it, uh, that's what I enjoyed. I like the flexibility that it gave me because when we would move, I would lose so much time, like six weeks on the front end, packing up and clearing out. I mean, you've got food that you got to get rid of or give it away. And then when we get someplace, we didn't always move right into a house. Sometimes they put us in a hotel. We didn't speak the language. We got to figure all that out. We don't have a vehicle. We got to figure out the transportation. And in Germany, it was trains and buses. And figuring all those things out in a new location, whether it's a foreign country where you speak the language or not. And that was that was helpful because I didn't have a check checkbox of, oh, I got to get this stuff done at this time or I'm behind. Because every time we moved, we would lose about three months, six weeks before and six weeks after that move. And there's a lot of pressure. Oh, I'm behind. So after a while, I said, I'm not behind. I'm right where God wants me to be. And I'm going to move forward from where I am now because there's too much stress and pressure to say, oh, I got to catch up. I got to get all this done. And you're just never going to get there. And so you just where you are is where you need to be. And you just take a step forward from that. And each day you put one foot forward and you move just a little bit. I also found that some of my kids did really well in one area and not so great in another. And there's this tendency to say, oh, they're behind, you know, just like mom's behind on her schedule. They're behind. Like in this behind subject. what? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. then people shine the spotlight on that. Oh, we got to focus on this. We got to get caught up. We got to get this done. And you don't understand this. Well, all that's going to do is make them think they're not any good at that. But if mm. you focus on where they're doing really well, they're going to excel and you're going to get way ahead there. And then you're going to feel less pressure because you go, oh, look how far they are here. And then you're going to go, oh, okay, I have a little bit of breathing room. And I still have kids that are not where they should be um, and they've graduated. So, but they're still functioning. They can still do everything that they need to do. Um, they might not be fluent in whatever language we took in high school, but they're still, they can still communicate. We can communicate in many languages. I have a daughter, I have four daughters, and I have three of them that struggle with some learning disabilities. But the first one I had, that struggled. She now speaks about five languages. She owns and operates an English school with her husband and they have four children in Turkey. And wow. that's what she does. Yeah. And they own it, operate it. But she was the child that was dyslexic and she didn't read fluidly till she was 14. And that was really hard because you're, I think churches are hard because they're like, hey, can you read this Bible verse? Hey, everybody's going to read this. You do this. And if they mm -hmm. struggle with that, then the church comes in or the teacher and goes, hey, you know, they're behind. Do you know this? Well, yes, I do know this. I live with them 24 seven. And I think sometimes that's hard on a mom's heart because your church is your safe place. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that when there's judgment, especially when we were just starting out with homeschooling. You feel right. like you're under a microscope or right. yes. you know, being looked yes. at anyway. I just think what you said, there's several things you said in there that I just want to park on for a minute, Barb, because all parents, whether they're moving internationally or not, are going to have years where their husband has lost a job mm -hmm. or their mother has died or they're taking care of an elderly parent or they have a dyslexic child that they're trying to figure out how to teach properly. And so our schedule by mid-year doesn't, doesn't come anywhere close to accomplishing what we thought we would in August. And, you know, Ray Vanderlaan, who is a Christian educator, PhD, loves academics, loves learning. But I love what he said. He said, the books we choose for our children is our curriculum. The interruptions God brings are his curriculum. And some things, I, I, sometimes I think God has other things he wants to teach us and wants to teach our children. And so, you know, I just remember when we were working in the legislature, I would come home and I would weep every night over workbook pages that didn't get done. 
And lo and behold, I have two boys who are very interested in politics. My second son's a lawyer. He is now chief counsel for the State Department of Education. He's a homeschool parent, never been in a homeschool classroom. I mean, that was God, the legislature and the court battles we fought, that was God's curriculum yes. for John. I could have never taught him that any other way. So I, I think we just need to embrace the interruptions that put us behind in the bookwork and 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 know that God really wants to teach our children through those things. And I want to talk just for a minute to what you said about having a dyslexic child and being behind. Sometimes I want to ask the question behind what, you know, you'll ask homeschool kids, what grade are you in? And they'll say, mm. they look at their parents because they might be 10 and be in high school history and geometry, but first grade, something else, you know, because they have different strengths and different weaknesses. And, and so I, I love what you say to focus on the strengths. It doesn't mean that we can ignore math altogether if they're not good yeah, at math, but it means that we learn how to help them compensate, learn what they need to learn, but focus on their strengths where they're going to be living their life in the world. So, boy, I just, I just appreciate that. And I wanted to point that out because not all, all of us live lives around the world, but we still have the same struggles in different ways that you were expressing. So, okay, Barb, tell us about um, your adoption story. I love this. Well, we had started looking at adoption when we moved to Alabama. We signed up with an agency and then we moved to Germany and we got there. Now this is at the beginning of the internet. People are just now getting email addresses when this is going on. And they were appalled that we were now not on the same continent. And we, you know, how are they gonna do that? They said, no, you can adopt from Germany, but you can't live in Germany and adopt. And I go, well, you can live here and adopt, but anyway, so wow. we ended up moving around. We ended up back in Idaho or in Idaho, not back in Idaho, but in Idaho. And I heard about a talk it was about an hour away in Boise. We lived in a little town called Mountain Home. And I drove up there and I listened to this talk and I thought, yes, this is, we can do this. So I signed up with Lutheran Social Services and we did our home study. We were moving along and all of a sudden, Bruce got a new job with the military <laughs> and they moved us to Germany. So we're back in Germany and I thought, oh, okay. And then we went from Germany to Washington, D.C., and then we were in the Philippines. We we're in the Philippines, and there are so many children that are abandoned. And I thought, okay, maybe we can do this. But in the Philippines, they said, you can't adopt unless you live here for three years, and then you can adopt. So wow. we, went to an, we went to this one agency there, a Philippine agency, and they were actually had their hands on the back of us, pushing us out the gate because they said, we can't work with you. And I, we to this day don't know what Bruce said, but he said something and they went, oh, and they took us back into an air conditioned room, which is huge in the Philippines because they don't put you in an air conditioned room unless you're a somebody. Unless they really and, like you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going, okay. And so they, they started talking to us. We had used Lutheran social services and they, that was an agency that this organization worked with in the Philippines. So we were like, great. So we went back to Lutheran Social Services, talked to the same lady. She said, we'll just update your home study with the Filipino agency, which we did. And we put in our packet, um, they kicked it back. They said it was too Christian. So we, we thought we'd really already kind of dumbed it down, but we redid it, put it back in <laughs> and they accepted it. And then some orphanage that was called Shekinah, by the way, in Northern, Philippines in a place called Luzon, <clears throat> they saw our package and they wanted us. Now you have to pick out three families. And these people said, no, this is the family for the kids that we have up for adoption. There were three. They'd never done an adoption before this orphanage hadn't. And we had not been in the Philippines three years. We'd been there about two and they matched us. I called every week to check. Were you, I mean, were you thinking about adopting one child? Had y'all had any conversations about adopting three at the same time? Well, we just decided we would adopt four because Bruce was only going to do it once. And I knew that <laughs> because the cost was the cost was exorbitant. And he was just like, no, we'll do this one time. So kind of like do it, get it out of your system. So I thought, OK. And in the Philippines and in any place in the world, sibling sets are really hard for people to adopt. Mm -hmm. They don't want sibling mm -hmm. sets. They want a baby that they can take from the beginning and and raise. And so we wanted to impact some lives that 
might not get a chance at a family. So we said we would take four. And in the Philippines, we did the research on the country. They give up their boys. They keep their girls and give up their boys. So we said, we'll take four boys. And so I called every week. And this one, um, Ms. Memorial Day, I called because they were open. It wasn't their Memorial Day. <laughs> it was that Monday I called and they said, oh, you've heard you've been matched. And I said, no, I didn't know we were matched. So they sent me everything. And at the top, it said Shekinah Home. And I said, that's a Christian name, Bruce. And there are no Christian orphanages. Any, any ones that we had heard about were not Christian. And it takes a lot of money for an orphanage in the Philippines to get their kids ready to adopt. So most of them don't do that unless they find a family that's going to adopt. And then they'll go through the paperwork. But so this orphanage had gone through the paperwork and I, the names were very American at the top of that form. So I picked up the phone and called him and the orphanage director answered and he said, oh, you're getting the siblings. And I said, yes. Now, I hadn't even told the orphanage yet, the other place in town, that we were going to take these kids. So I'm calling directly saying yes. And I said, when can I come? And he goes, how about a week from Wednesday? So I said, great. So I called the place back and I said, we'll take them. We're getting our airline reservations. So Bruce and I were flying up and then they came and said, wait a minute, you can't go get those kids. You don't have this paper. I said, give me the paper. I'm leaving tomorrow morning to get my kids. So we flew up. We had to stay for five days. There was no air conditioning. There were no refrigerators. There was no cold water. These kids are out there. I mean, it was tough. I got a migraine up there. It's so hot, 115 in the shade. Goodness. And um, after a couple days, they said, you know, you guys look fine together. You can leave. And I said, no, we're going to stay with what you've said. Five days. How old were they when you got them? Uh, they were six and four the day we picked them up. It was Father's Day. So they were six and four. But by the time the adoption was finalized, they were seven and five. And I say they, it's not just two when I'm saying these ages. The little boy was seven and there were twin girls okay. that were five or okay. six and four. So there were three of them. And girls. I mean, we didn't expect any girls at all. We thought it was going to be all boys. All boys. Mm -hmm. And so that was a surprise. But the orphanage hadn't done an adoption away, like out of their province. So the kids getting on the plane and flying, they, the orphanage people, the, the workers, they were like, oh, they're going to cry. So they're all crying at the airport. And these three just walked through, put their little backpacks that we'd given them up there with all these toys and things. Just put them on the conveyor belt. They go to they, they hadn't really seen airplanes. Their noses were up against the windows. We get on the plane. I mean, they'd never done any of this. So then uh, the adoption that was in June. So we came back to the states. Now, wait a minute. Could y'all speak the same language when you adopted them? Because these children are not babies, so they're talking. Yeah, they spoke a dialect called Ilocano. Bruce and I could maybe do some Tagalog, which was the main language in the Philippines. And Justin, that was our son, he spoke a little Tagalog when we got him, but he mostly spoke Ilocano. So the three of them would converse and then he might tell us what they're saying. And, but no, we didn't. We couldn't really converse for probably about five months, six months. They've got better. So we came back to the States. And when you come back to the States and you're going to adopt internationally, when they hit the, the U.S. soil, they're American citizens. And so they were issued new birth certificates. Our name is on there. And... They uh, had never seen snow. And one day we're here and Justin goes, because it's January, he goes, can I go out in the snow? And I'm like, sure. I never thought to say to him, make sure you have your parka and your boots on. And I look outside and he's riding around in my sister-in-law's cul-de-sac. He's blue. Now keep in mind, he's very dark skinned. And I could tell across the street, he was blue. And I go run out there and he didn't have any shoes on. He didn't have a coat on because he's not used to that in the Philippines. You just walk out the door. You don't need any That's protection. That's right. That's right. So he was, they just <laughs> were not used to that. But then right after that, uh, we came back, went back to the Philippines. We flew to Romania was our next assignment. And in March of that year, the girls, Riley and Kiara, were sitting next to the president of the United States, President Bush in Romania. And so they went from in 12 months before that, where they had no hope, they had no family, no parents, to now they're sitting next to one of the most powerful men in the world. And we have the picture with them and Justin's kind of behind, he's not in the picture, but it was, it really was an amazing, an amazing journey for them. You know, isn't it a picture of the way God adopts us into his family? He takes us out of our brokenness and he sits us at his table. I mean, that is just such a beautiful, yeah. That's such a beautiful picture. So um, how did your other children, your biological children, do with the adoption? 
they did fine. My oldest one, though, we had to put together a packet. And because they were over 21, they had to write letters, affidavit, because when you adopt, you can't disinherit your adopted children. And so they were essentially going from 50% of whatever estate we had to 20%. So they had to sign off that that was okay for them oh, in the Philippines. They had to say that. So our older daughter said, I don't think my mom and dad really know how old they are. So to throw this out there, Bruce and I were both over 50 when we did this in adventure. Oh, man. And yeah. So she is like, I don't think my mom and dad know how old they are. And our younger one, who was just three years younger, was like, oh, she'll, they'll be fine. You know, they'll be wonderful parents. And so she just, the letters were totally different. So we stuck one of them way underneath in the pile. thought maybe they won't read all the way down there. <laughs> But uh, no, but overall, they're fine. They're both fine now. And we all get together. We're planning to be all together at Christmas this year because the ones that live in Turkey are in the United States for the next six months. So oh, our son and the great. Marines will come home. That's another example, really, of how, uh, how the world is your classroom and homeschooling. You know, just the things you learn through life, adopting children into your home. That's a learning experience for everybody and such a a growing experience um, spiritually. That's amazing. Would you encourage other people to consider adoption, Barb? Yes, I would. But you need to go in to the process and everything with your eyes wide open. Um, you can't be thinking, oh, if I adopt an infant, there won't be the trauma that an older child will have endured. But you really need to read the stories and the books and know that even as an infant, there will be some trauma and you need to help your kids, not just you, but maybe get them some professional counseling on how to deal with some of those things. Because some of the, um, when I had the professional testing done on the three younger ones that we adopted, there were things that, that she told us like, oh, they'll never be able to do this. Oh, they'll never be able to do that. And I just, I just said, no but got them in counseling and then did other things. I mean, she told me that my children, these three would never play sports and they're all very athletic. I mean, not just with skiing, but with soccer or basketball or baseball. I mean, they made all-star teams and were drafted to, you know, the, the special groups um, for sports. So she was not right about that, even though that's her profession, psychoanalysis. And so yes. getting them um, counseling, family counseling, and helping them to realize, okay, this trauma that the mom and dad I have now had nothing to do with and helping them to work through. I think going into adoption with your eyes wide open. Listen, that is a great segue into some of the things you're doing. Now, how long did y'all homeschool in all? Oh gosh, Zan, 32 years, I think. You haven't abandoned the homeschooling community since your last ones graduated. Tell us what you're doing now stateside, and then we'll talk about the global things. Okay, well, stateside, I'm really involved locally um, in a little homeschool group right here in Colorado Springs. And I like to host the mom's retreat every year. And that's where, Zan, you came and spoke. And I like to give those moms a time to get away. So they don't really pay. They bring food. We have a menu and they say, okay, and they sign up for different food. Or when they're there, they say, okay, well, I'll help cook breakfast or I'll be on cleanup crew. So even though it's not a complete, they come back and kick up their feet. They come and we have a very loose schedule, but then I minister to their hearts. And it's not just me. It's all the moms that are there. It's you that come as the speaker ministering to them that they can get away for a time and get refocused, refocused on the Lord, refocused on their husbands, their children, homeschooling, help them to get the priorities back in line because we all get them out of line and it just mm -hmm, helps. Mm -hmm. So that's in that group. That's my little support group. And I really love them. I love the ladies. I love the kids. I love the families. And then here in Colorado, in a wider scale, I do a Facebook group called Homeschooling Colorado. And I try to put on their free days at all the museums, or if there's a special class at the Butterfly Pavilion, or if there's something special going on at the Mining Museum, they do classes just for homeschoolers or homeschool week at any place. I try to get that out there because I felt like when I got here, I didn't really know what was in Colorado. It was a new location for me. And everybody's like, oh yeah, I knew that, but I didn't know that. <laughs> so right. I try to, on this page, I think there's about 10,000, 11,000 people on it for just That's Colorado. Amazing. So you have to live in Colorado to be on the page. 
And I really try to regulate just for Wednesday's business, Saturday, you know, any curriculum we want to sell. And now I thought it was interesting when you talked about, they said your three adopted kids would never be, do anything athletic. And yet they did. And, and so I find it so fascinating that you have a sports ministry and I love the way you're doing this because it's not for high end athletes, although there's a place for organizations like that. Tell us a little bit about your sports um, organization. Okay. Well, it's Colorado Springs homeschool sports league. And what we did was I think about seven or eight years ago was a mom who started it and she was very loosely doing it. And then when more money was coming in, there were a couple of us who were like, we have to get organized because we can't be bringing in money without being organized. So we right. had a couple of great people who knew what they were doing. So we're a 501c3 and we offer six sports and it's not at the same time. So we have in the fall and in the spring, we have soccer and flag football. And then to kick off the year, we do basketball. Then we have volleyball twice. We have that right in the middle of winter and then right in the middle of summer. We have a swim team and track and field. And those are offered, it covers five weeks, but it starts on a day and ends on a day. So it covers six weeks of, of or six days of sports. And all the practice and the games are at the same time. It's all ages at the same time. So if mom and dad wanna come with, like we go down to three years old for soccer. So if they wanna come with their three-year-old up to their 18-year-old, they're in the same place at the same time, not on the same field or the same court, but they're in the same location. So it's one-stop shopping. And then we don't charge per child because we don't want families to say, oh, I can't do that for all my kids. I'll just sign up some of my kids. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. have a per family fee and nothing is over a hundred dollars. Everything is under a hundred dollars. Um, we have a t-shirt that we have for the league. That's our uniform. Uh, so everything is her family that they can afford. And if there is a family that comes and says, Hey, I just can't, which I have had that I've got some jobs that I, you can help me with. And then I will just write off your, your registration fee. And so that's the sports league. And I, I do love it. I love the kids. And even though we are not a competitive league, it doesn't mean that there aren't kids in there who are competitive and who are really good and right. have a lot yes. of good skills. Yes, yes. So moms out there who have graduated your last homeschooling, I hope you'll do like take a page from um, Barb's notebook and not just walk away from homeschooling, but look back and see how you can help women who are currently in the trenches homeschooling take a load off their plate by providing, you know, some of these ministries and some of these opportunities for their kids. I just, I think it's really important for those of us who have homeschooled to give back because it's hard to do yes. all of that when you're in the process of homeschooling. Um, so Barb, I want to ask you as we close, what advice you would give to homeschoolers who are having a hard day or have a hard season, but Real quickly, tell us a little bit about the Global Home Education um, Exchange and what you're seeing internationally among homeschool okay. families. Those are two totally different questions. I okay. know. I know. I want to cover them both, and I want you to have an hour for both, but you can't take okay, it. Well, the Global Home <laughs> Education Exchange, there is a webpage for that, um, G-H-E-X, and we try to do a conference globally, internationally, not in the United States, although we hope to one day have it in the United States, but in different countries. So we've done it in Germany. We've done it in Brazil. We did it in Russia, in two cities in Russia. Yeah, I was there for that one. Yep. We had one planned for the Philippines, but COVID kind of derailed us a little bit. And this next one is next summer, just outside of London, Manchester in England, in the UK. So that'll be next summer, July 2024, I think is when that's going to be. And I help with the conference. I will get speakers. I come up with the workshop topics. And right now we're working on next summers and I'm going to do the family track. I'm the coordinator heading that up. And then I have other people from around the world that work with me on that. We don't want to see these international trends where they want to close homeschooling down coming to the United States. So the more we're engaged in freedom fighting around the globe for homeschooling, I think it, it benefits the people internationally. It benefits us and having that coalition of, of international leaders, I just think is powerful, powerful. Um, okay, so your so, question about the moms, you know, what yes. to tell homeschool moms. Yes. Okay. You need to relax. You need to take a step back. So when I say relax, that's relax for you. That's not relax for what 
your husband would do or what your homeschool other mom friend would do. What do you need to do to relax? And always relax is going to mean that you put the schedule away, that you cross stuff off that to-do list and you don't get them done. You just put it away. It's, it's for you to kick back and breathe. And you might not leave your house. You might go to the coffee shop. You might go shopping. It's whatever you need to do to relax. And you need to give up control because you really um, cannot control everything, especially if you have a child that has an issue or you're taking care of a sick parent or someone is dying. Um, My mom moved in with us for a while and that was a hardship. It was really difficult and making different decisions and taking over someone else's care besides your children. So figure out how to relax and here you go. I'm going to give you a couple steps. One, you need to focus on only one or two things. If it's laundry, then homeschooling is not happening that day. You're only doing laundry. If you need to say, I need to get my menu in order. Okay. Work with your kids. Talk about what they're going to, what they would like to see for dinner or lunch or breakfast and work together. It's all a learning experience, but you need to figure out what you're going to focus on for just a few things. And if it's homeschooling, then great, but pair homeschooling down because everybody's like, oh, I have math and I have science and I have language arts and I have history and I got to do computer science. And then we got to throw in music lessons. I mean, all those are good, but you need to just pick one or two. And that's all you're going to focus on. Second thing, school is not Monday through Friday. School is Saturday through Sunday. It's not from nine to three, it's 24 seven. And it's not just reading, writing and arithmetic. It's life. It's the whole person. It's the emotional part of the person. It's the character part of the person. I have, well, I have, like I said, I have five children, but my youngest was a Bible quiz coach at our church. She taught ASL. She was a teacher in our co-op, in our homeschool co-op. I had all my kids teach classes. They had to make lesson plans, figure out the class they wanted to teach and, and then organize it and teach it for nine weeks. Well, now she is going through certification for Montessori and the main person here in Colorado is saying, why are you going through this so quickly? So she's meeting with her saying, how do you know this? And because she's a homeschooler, she experienced some things that a lot of people who want to be teachers never did. I mean, they've gone to college and haven't actually taught a classroom of kids and come up with lesson plans, but she is so far ahead because we did that as part of life. And the third thing is you need to have fun. You need to put fun in. If you need to schedule it, schedule it, but put fun in there. We have field trips, you have park days, um, maybe build a tree house. I remember when we were learning about pulleys, we just, we didn't have a tree house, but we threw it over a tree and we did pulleys and that was amazing. You know, one pulley lifts so much, but you add another pulley and you can lift twice as much and just things like that. We also played games at lunchtime. I have games that my kids just say, oh, mom, those are in such bad shape. Yep. Because they live through five kids playing games at lunch. Oh, that's and, great. That's a great idea for lunchtime. Yep. That's we, And we always stop school at lunchtime. So when lunchtime came, that was the end of school and we were going to go have fun. We were going to go on a field trip or we were going to meet with another family, maybe just play games. We we're going to meet them at the library. And this, like I said before, it's not socialization for just your kids. It's you, mom. Moms have to be, be socialized. They have to get out and make those heart connections and find their, their best friend, their BFF and, <laughs> and find those people and hang out with them and go on walks and hikes and, and have fun. Tell um, moms and dads out there how they can find you if they want to get in touch with you. So Barb's in Charge is my Instagram. And then Barbara West is my Facebook. And I have a caricature for my picture. I have always, I mean, we're friends, but I have always benefited from your wisdom and your energy and your spiritual insight into life. And I know you have given our listeners and viewers here today so much to think about. Well, thank you, Zan. I could say the same back at you because when I first met you and Joe um, at Glen Airy in Colorado, I was just blown away. I thought, here's a person. That's where there's a heart connection. That's what I'm talking about. Moms getting out and socializing because when you meet that person where you have a heart connection, you know it. And even though you and I don't live anywhere near each other, um, we have a heart connection. And I love that about you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, everybody, thank you for being here. If you want more information um, about me, you can go to zantyler.com. I want to thank our sponsor, BJU Press Homeschool. If you want more information on them, you can go to their website. And if you need help, you can go to a consultant at homeschoolhelp.com slash map. Click on the state where you live and you can find a consultant there who will help you with um, curriculum questions. So thank you so much for being here. As always, it's been a blessing. And until next week, bye.